Welcome to Season 3 of Far Reach Voyages, where we share our love of sailing and adventure travel. Sunday, the 16th of June, day 7. Had a long night last night. Went some squalls that didn't really amount to a whole lot. You're never really sure. So I was up off and on pretty much most of the night until about 3.30 in the morning when I was able to sleep. We made half a dozen sail changes last night trying to get the right combination. Wind would go light and then we'd get a kind of cold air and sail under clouds and go to double reef main and a stay sail and we wouldn't get much wind and just normal stuff. A lot of light air yesterday. We only made about 118 miles. I have some light air sails. I don't tend to fly them by myself when it's sea states like this. Because uh, if the servo blade trips on the wind vane in the boat, just something crazy, end up with a big drifter wrapped around my head stay and caught my spreaders. And we kept the boat moving. A little bit of rain. So home is that way, 500 miles. So we've come about 750. And the Turks, not the Turks and Caicos, the uh, Great Abaco Island is that way, about 90 miles which I could divert to this morning. I'd be there tomorrow. Let's stop the video here for a minute to discuss why I'm talking about diverting to the Abacos. Vice just heaving to and waiting for the weather event to pass. Seems like an overreaction, doesn't it? Well, there's something else going on I'm not talking about in the video with potentially serious consequences. I'm having an outbreak of shingles. For those of you who don't know what shingles is, it's a virus caused by chickenpox, which I had as a kid. It's always in you, and it hides from the immune system and the nerves that supply sensation to the skin. It can lay dormant for years, as it had for me. But as you get older and your immune system weakens, it can escape the nerves and erupt on the skin as open lesions. I had one outbreak before many years ago when I was in college. It was bad, and it hurt like hell. I had a vivid memory of it. I knew it's usually worse for you if you get it when you're older. Typically, it follows a major nerve around your chest to your back and often remains confined to that area. I had asked for the shingles vaccine before I sailed in December, but was told I did not meet the age criteria, which they subsequently lowered. I've since received the double vaccine. Anyway, I carry the International Medical Guide for Ships on the Far Reach, a gift from my sister Tricia. I looked up shingles, and it reminded me that while it can be painful, if it gets on your face, it can involve your eyes, and you can lose your vision. The book recommends prompt evacuation if it gets in your eyes. How are you going to get evacuated single-handing without abandoning your boat? And that's not happening. Besides, I believe as a single-hander, you have to accept some risk and responsibility for yourself and your boat. Thus, I was considering diverting to the Abacos for medical attention, if needed, since I also had this weather system bearing down, and I didn't want to sail north into a series of lightning storms anyway. This is just one of those worrisome things that single-handers have to consider on a long passage. You have to be able to sail the boat, but that can be difficult or impossible if you get seriously sick or injured. While this could be much worse, I was still okay, which is a lot better than falling down the companionway and breaking an arm or getting a bad head injury or a serious burn from a galley accident or onboard fire. So for the next couple of days, all this was on my mind as I was working my way through the decision process to determine the best course of action. So let's get back to the video. The challenge is there's this big impulse of energy coming off of Florida that I'm supposed to cross paths with Tuesday. Lots of thunderstorms, squally weather, 
but it's mostly from the southwest, which would bring me a lot of wind, which I, would help speed me on my way. And if I can make 120 miles a day, which I should be able to do, unless the wind goes completely light today and tomorrow, then I would be in to Beaufort early Thursday morning. Thursday evening there's supposed to be this big weather event there with low pressure off of New England causing strong southwesterlies along the Carolina coast of 20 to 35 knots, gusts to 40. And I don't know if there's any north component wind to it. It's been briefed as a southwesterly. So it's not so much the danger of the Gulf Stream, it's just you're running down on a lee shore. I had to try to get in by Thursday morning. So I'm sort of contemplating all that. You can see this blue sky overhead. A lot of clouds all the way around the horizon. There's definitely a lot of moisture in the air. You can feel it. I'm sailing as much downwind as I want. I didn't really want to put the pole out last night with all the lightning I was seeing around. I didn't want to have to struggle with a whisker pole when the wind was, you know, if we got hit by a big squall. So I reached a little more last night, which gave us a little more north movement, north direction. I need a little northwest. If I get too far out there, in the direction the camera's pointing, I run the risk of running out of air. So I need to stay more over this way. So I'll probably put the pole out this morning and get a little more movement to the northwest and sort of make up my mind what I'm going to do. It's a challenge to keep the boat moving fast when you're by yourself, especially in unsettled conditions because you always, or should be, conservative in what you're doing. You have to sleep, and you don't want to sleep with the boat teetering on the edge if as fast as it'll go, and then you get hit by a squall, and now you got all kinds of drama that you don't want, some kind of rodeo out here. You can get hurt or damage your boat or any number of different things. As far as single-handed sailing. Supposed to be a lot of squalls over there toward the Abaco, so I could just be getting myself into some other mess over there. I might be better off just to keep shooting for what I got in front of me. It's time for breakfast. Been watching this thing for the last 45 minutes. Started off as sort of a nondescript, medium-sized cumulus cloud. It's turned into a cumulonimbus. A lot of rain down there, and I've been watching it, seeing if it was gonna cross over us or if we were gonna be able to slip past. It looks like it's paralleling us, and I can't tell if it's getting closer or if it's just getting bigger so it looks like it's getting closer, or maybe both. I don't see a lot of wind down there. Usually when these things come over, they suck all the wind out though, and you're left wallowing, almost no wind. We just got a reef main and a working jib up, pulled out wing and wing. I may drop the pole just to give us more flexibility. We got to know in the next half hour what's going to happen. Got my harness on and my raincoat. Big ship on the horizon, looks like it's going into the rain. 
I'll have to see what the AIS says about him. He's obviously over two miles CPA. I only get a warning if the CPA is within two miles. We'll take a look, see what he is. Well, that's definitely not him. So, that other ship is not transmitting. Because Hamburg went by on the other side a while ago. Well, let's take a look. Turns out it was the Hamburg. She crossed our bow from port to starboard. And if you look, I don't see much rain coming down from this cloud now, this thunderhead. It, I think it rained itself out. Usually, they only last about 30 minutes. There's still some rain back there, but that's from some different set of clouds. There could be a little sprinkling here, but there's no downpour like I was seeing come down from it earlier. So, I think we're going to be all right here. Keep an eye out for any wind. And of course, you always worry about the white squalls. You know, the downrushing of wind that's coming from someplace further away. You know, so air rises up to get to the top and it cools and then suddenly it starts rushing down. It can rush down 10, 12 miles away. I think that's what caused the Pride of Baltimore to found in these waters in 1986, I think. And that's the Black Cat Systems. HF faxed software app for my iPad. My earbuds plugged into my HF shortwave receiver. Downloading weather facts. The key is to dial in 1.9 kilohertz below the stated frequency for the weather facts. Very good. I tried to get a direct data feed line for it, but I, what I got apparently wasn't the right stuff and it didn't work. So I'm back to using the earbuds, which is okay. A direct data feed would be better. This is the Sargasso I've been talking about. It comes by and balls. You can see how it's locked up there on the steering or the servo or so when that steering blade loads up in the nuts our gas it just trips so what I've been doing is taking the boat hook just slide it down there pulling it off seems to work okay I can't do it constantly though Sometimes I'll have it clean and go below and the thing will trip and a big clump got right on it. And more kelp. Not kelp. More uh, sargasso. Look out there, you can see large tracks. I've seen it hundreds of yards wide by hundreds and hundreds of yards long, acres of it, on the way down last winter. About 100 miles north of St. Martin. The last time home from St. Martin, North Carolina, about this time, I don't remember seeing a whole lot of sargasso. Let's see, there's just no way the vein can handle all that. And I think that's why it trips at night. Look at that. What I'm doing here is what sailors call shaking out a reef. I'm increasing the sail area of the mainsail. Previously, when the wind increased, I shortened the mainsail. 
called tucking in a reef. I want to keep the boat moving smartly, and to do that I add and shorten sail area as the wind velocity changes. When sailing the boat efficiently, I'm constantly adjusting the sails, both in terms of sail area as well as angles of attack called sail trim. Different boats have different parameters for reefing. Some require reefing sooner than others. Knowing when to reef comes with experience. Reefing the mainsail in the far reach is pretty simple, and it's important to be that way on an offshore boat. The far reach carries a lot of sail area, so I have to be cautious and not allow her to get overpowered as the wind increases. Keeping your boat moving and yet under control is an important part of being a competent sailor. Sailing down wind, tracking this thunderhead off to the port side. Lots of rain. Haven't had much thunder, but I got a big boom of thunder. We were pretty close, just kind of parallel, and I was watching. I didn't see a lot of wind on the water or anything. So we got a blast of wind and started to rain, and I scurried around and got the pole down because we were wing and wing. Got a reef in the main, and then um, decide to go ahead and generate some apparent wind by changing course and the direction of the wind so we were kind of close all beating, not close reaching more than beating. If I was really close all, I wouldn't. I'd be going away from where I want to go. We want to be sailing about you know, three three zero. Right now we're sailing 030, so we're sailing north-northeast. We want to be sailing north-northwest, but I want to get some distance from the that big thunderhead. And once we started generating apparent wind, we're making almost six knots now. We were making three before, going downwind with pole up and We need to make 120 miles a day to make it into Beaufort before this big weather event they're expecting Thursday night, Thursday afternoon. And we've been doing pretty well up until now. I mean, we've been sailing really light wind downwind, which is not the way to make a lot of time. That's just the way we have to go. Broad. Broad reaching doesn't, doesn't do much. You know, the wind's so shifty, a lot of times the main blocks the jib, so I pull it out and then I sail a little deeper to get pressure on the sail. We're moving, it's fine, but our speed drops off. If we have 15 knots, we'll make five to five and a half. When we get down like we were today, a part of yesterday, during the daytime, the diurnal pattern, we were only getting maybe 12 knots, 10 knots wind, we were getting, you know, three and four knots of speed over ground. I haven't noticed a lot of current. I think we had current earlier, it just doesn't seem to be a lot right now. So, I'll let the boat run this way for just a bit, and then we'll head off back in the direction we need to go. The problem is, if we get too far east, where we need to be, the wind even gets lighter. So we need to stay to the west as much as we can before we hit our line of longitude, 7630. And we'll start working our way north. Now I'm going northeast, north northeast, and I'm not even to 7630. We're at about 7530 right now. We got about something miles to go before we get to. Feels good to be moving though. Even if it's not in the direction we need to go. We are going north, so that's something. If you enjoyed this episode of Far Reach Voyages, let us know in the comments. Also, consider liking and subscribing, as it tells us you would like to see more videos and it helps the channel grow. 
See you next episode.